17, beginning at verse 20. This is immediately before Jesus' arrest. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I in them and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity, to let the world know, to let Fruitport know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. The word of our Lord. Well, good morning. I was told I have 20 minutes. We're going to dive right in. If you have that passage of scripture that uh, Pastor John happened to read for us out of John chapter 17, either on your phone or in your Bible, please follow along. And what I want to talk about this morning is the prayer that Jesus gives, that recorded prayer that we have. The first third of that prayer, Jesus prays for himself, much like you and I would pray for ourselves at a certain point in time. The, the second third of that prayer, Jesus is praying for his disciples, those that are working closely with and following him. And in the final third of that prayer, he's praying for all believers. And that's the part that pertains to all of us across this hillside. All the believers in Jesus Christ, all those that have given your life, made a personal decision of faith in Jesus as your Savior and Lord. This is who he's speaking to right here, right now. So I want to take that message that Christ has for us, that John read for us, and say, what, what does Jesus have to say to us on a day like today? And what can we do with that, and how will that help us all together as churches? So he makes a couple of, of key statements right there in the very beginning, Jesus does. He says, my prayer is that all of them might be one. Now, I have to tell you something. At my church, and I have a lot of our church here. Where's my Genesis church people at? Yeah, we have a lot of us here today. Uh, I, I like feedback, so if you sit there and stare at me like this, then I preach a lot longer. So, so if you, there we go. All right. So if you get involved in what's going on and have a conversation with me here with God's Word, it's going to help us all to learn a little bit better. His, his prayer is that we all function together as one church, as followers and believers in Jesus Christ. He also makes a statement right after that in verses 20 and 21 where he says that may they be brought, may all believers be brought to complete unity. Now it's at this point that many people might stiffen their back up a little bit and say, you know what, Jamie, I don't think we can have unity because we're all so different. Tell the person next to you, you're different. Really different. Now, now tell that same person back, you're different too. You're different too. Now the person on the other side of you you didn't talk to at all, they're really different. <laughs> he's, he's saying we need to come together in complete unity and that's difficult because we have seven different churches represented here and, and I would bet that if we would spend the next seven weeks visiting each of our churches, we would find seven different styles in seven different experiences, and hopefully all revolving around God's Word and His Son, Jesus Christ. But how that's implemented and what that looks like in each church service and with each church family is often radically different, right? And that's okay, but how do we come together with unity? Let, let me describe what unity is not. Unity is not uniformity. 
That does not mean that we have to all look the same. Somebody say thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we don't have, you don't all have to look like me. That's right. Thank you, Lord. I agree. I agree. Because some of you are are looking at me going, Pastor Jamie, you didn't really dress up for today. And, And I'm looking at me going, I dressed up more than normal. I wore a collared shirt. And, and some of you are thinking, well, I don't know about some of these songs that we sang. I don't know any of them. And I'm thinking, well, can we get a song from the last couple of years, please? I mean, they're good songs. What, what that means is different perspectives. It's not right. It's not wrong. It's just different. It's not uniformity. What we must agree on is that Jesus Christ is what matters most. Amen. It's not uniformity. So unity also is not... It, it is not simply coexisting together. I, I know of many marriages that they coexist together, but they don't really enjoy one another. They don't really speak to one another. For our churches to simply coexist in the same town, in the same area, that's not unity. That's just acknowledging there's another church around the corner, but we have nothing to do with them or as little as possible. That is not unity. Unity also is not isolation. It is not pulling ourselves back, doing our own thing our own way, and not even talking to or acknowledging anybody else at all. That's not unity either. So Jesus addresses this in John chapter 17, verses 20 through 26. And he challenges all of us, and he would give the same challenge to all of us today and the same prayer to all of us today to be together as one. But what does that look like? What is it that we are unified on And what pulls us all together, whether you are front row fanatics or you're back row Baptist way back there? What is it? We don't have any Baptists here today, I don't think, right? What is it that pulls us? (laughs) We don't now. (laughs) My background is all Baptist, so I'll I'll take the brunt of that one. What, What pulls us all together? This is what Jesus identifies here. So let's take a look at a couple of thoughts for us this morning to help us realize that even though we represent seven different churches, we can all function and become like Jesus because he says to us, may they be one. And this happens when we accept the fact that, first of all, we are adopted by the same Father. In the first couple of verses where Christ is talking there, verses 20 through 23, as he's he's addressing the prayer to all believers, he he really wants all of us to experience and to share what it is the Father has given to all of us. And he talks about how the Father is in him and how the Father loves him. We just sang a tremendous song about that. You are a good, good Father. It's who you are. And I am loved by you. And I hope that we sing that understanding. That comes right from Scripture itself. It's pure truth. And if we can realize we are all adopted if you're a follower of Christ, by the same Father into God's family, that pulls us together in unity. We have a a family in our church right now that is finalizing the adoption process of a couple of girls that are age three and age five. And I believe, I got the date, August 22nd, is that correct? That's when when it all comes together, that's when it all finishes up. And and these girls, yeah, go ahead and give them a hand. It's an exciting time for them. It's been fun for me to watch them. And watch that family dynamic take place and and watch some of the struggles they've had. I get to go home at the end of the day, so it's been really fun to watch. But the girls have been living with them for for six, seven months now. And I've loved watching these, these, these two little girls run up to Michael and say, Daddy. And grab a hold of his shirt and pull on, Daddy. Girls that really haven't had a father figure to count on in their life. But now they do. It's not even their family. But Michael has said, you are my family. You belong in my family. I'm going to make you a part of my family. And Michael and Jill said, you are our family. And I've adopted you. Romans chapter 8 gives a great picture of this, as does many places in the Bible about adoption. But Romans chapter 8 verse 15, it says that to all believers, you've received the spirit of of sonship or daughtership or you, you become a child of God. So much so that by that fact, we can call him Abba, Father. 
the word meaning daddy. What brings us all together, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, is that we have a heavenly father that looked down upon every one of us in our sinful condition, in our lost condition, and he said to us, I want you, and I want you, and I choose you, and I pick you, and I want you, and yes, even you, Casey, I want you. <laughs> he says to all of us, I choose you to eight billion people across this planet. He says, I want you, and give us the invitation to become one of his children. That pulls us together, regardless of what church we happen to go to and what church family we happen to be a part of. Aren't you glad we have a Father that loves us in spite of who we are and says, I want you, amen? Amen. He also continues. Yeah, give him a hand. He also continues, and he says, not only are you adopted by the same Father, but you are also redeemed by the same Savior. You are redeemed by the same Savior. Verse 20, the end of the verse, he says, I'm praying all these things. I pray also that you will believe in me, that those who will believe in me through their message. I'm praying for those that will believe. I'm praying for those that are going to believe that I am the Son of God. I'm praying for those that will find salvation through me. Because earlier, a couple chapters earlier, Jesus said to the crowd, he said, I am the way, and I am the truth, and I am the... Life. I am the life, and no man comes to the Father except through me, through me Jesus says. You say, what, what is one of the things that makes us united in spite of our differences? How can we be Christians united in faith? Because we have a Savior that loves us, a Savior that died for us, a Savior that shed his blood for us on the cross, a Savior that says, I have died that you might have life and have it abundantly. As he says to, to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Verse 16, anybody know how that verse starts? For God so loved the world, that will be the hillside. And whoever believes in him shall not perish. Well, we skipped part, didn't we? For God so loved the world, help me out, that he gave his, his one and only son. That's Jesus. That's his proof that he loves us. That's what saves us. That whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have the everlasting life. I'm thankful that I have a Savior that loved me. I'm thankful that I have a Savior that died on the cross just for me. I'm thankful that I have a Savior that saw me in my sinful condition and said, I will pay your price and your penalty for your sin and take it upon my shoulders. I'm thankful I have a Savior that went to the cross for me, that went to the grave for me, but he rose again for me. And he's alive and victorious today to give me victory in life, right? Amen. That pulls us all together as one in Jesus Christ. Because all of life is all about Jesus. It's always about Jesus. It's only ever about Jesus. We've all been adopted by the same Father. We've all been saved or redeemed by the same Savior. We've all been occupied, number three, by the same Spirit. We've all been occupied or filled by the same Spirit. He does not address that specifically here in John 17, but a couple of chapters earlier in John 14. He's talking to the disciples saying, hey, I'm going to be leaving you soon. But, but it's okay because when I leave, somebody better is going to take my place. His name is the Counselor. His name is the Spirit of Truth. And he's going to live in you. He's going to fill you. He's going to occupy you. And then verse 18 of chapter 14, he says, Christ says to his followers, I will not leave you as orphans. Aren't you glad that Christ did not leave us hanging on our own to live life on our own, but gave us the Holy Spirit to follow with direction and guidance and help to follow him? I won't leave you as orphans because God our Heavenly Father has adopted us. Jesus Christ the Son has saved us. Now God the Holy Spirit has filled us to live for him, to follow him. We've been occupied by the same Spirit. We read in Romans chapter, chapter 8, verse 9, that, that all those that belong to Jesus Christ are controlled by the Spirit of God living inside of us. So what, what makes us all united in faith? We've been adopted by the same Father. We've been saved by the same Savior. We've been filled by the same Spirit. Now it'll flow out of our life and show in our life. What does that result in? What does that look like? What does that mean from here forward? 
If we are really all united in faith, if Christ is saying, I'm praying that you might be one, and here's the mandate. He says, I'm praying that you might be one the same way, Father, that you and I are one. So here's our challenge by Jesus. He wants us all to function together and live together and operate together the same way that he and the Father relate together. That's quite the challenge, right? So no more arguing, no more fighting, no more dissension. No more disagreeing. We've been adopted by the same Father. Somebody shout amen. amen. Somebody shout same team. Same team. Same team. We're all on the same team. We're all in the same family. If you know Christ as your Savior and Lord, you've been saved by the same Savior, Jesus Christ, filled with the same Spirit. Ephesians says our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against the evil forces of this world. That's who our battle is against. So we can disagree in a lot of peripheral things as long as we understand we're pulled together by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And here's the result of that. What that looks like is that we all participate, number four, in the same mission. We all participate in the same mission. The very end of this passage, verse 26, Jesus says, I'm praying all these things that they will continue to be one until they make this truth known. What truth? That we've all been adopted by the same Father, all been saved by the same Spirit, all been, filled, all been saved by the same Savior, all been filled by the same Spirit. Take this truth, take this good news to the world that desperately needs to hear it. Take this good news that needs to know it. This good news that needs to find out who Jesus is. And we all live in this neighborhood. We all live in this community. And they need to know the life-saving power and the hope only given by Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. What are you doing to answer Jesus' prayer? What are you doing personally? What are you doing as a church? What are we doing as a united front to answer Jesus' prayer right here in Fruitport? What are we going to do? God, may you revive us again and put in us again a spirit of hope to go out into the world and take your news and your light and your gospel to those that desperately are longing to hear. Amen? May he revive us again from the inside out. Stand together, sing with us, please. For the Son of thy love